I'm going to be reading from 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 14. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says the light, he is in the light, hates his brother, is still in darkness. However, or whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write you, children, because you know the Father. I write you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. This is the word of the Lord. I want to start today with a history lesson because I think it gives us context for what we just heard and what John wrote today. And uh, this gives us a, a reason as well why Christianity spread so rapidly in the first centuries and a reason even why you and I are here today at this church. Uh, as the second century of Christianity began to unfold, the Christian faith, like I said, had spread all throughout the Roman Empire, particularly to some of its great cities, cities like Rome and Carthage in North Africa. And at that same time, Christians were also held in great suspicion from neighbors and government officials because they had given up behaviors that had previously been identified to them and their pagan lifestyle that they had before they became Christians. So wild rumors began circulating around about what Christians actually taught, what they believed, what they said in the gatherings they had together. And so there became this air of suspicion around Christianity in the early days. And to clear this air of suspicion and to defend Christianity, there was a church leader in Carthage, or from Carthage, whose name was Tertullian, who wrote a brief explanation of Christian practices and a critique of these unjust accusations that were made against Christians in that second century. In this work, which was called the famous Apology, he had the audacity to write out that these attacks on Christians were actually made out of jealousy by the world who was watching them. And he said that Christians displayed a character of life that their pagan neighbors did not possess, but other people wanted so badly, so they just knew how to throw stones at them. One statement highlighted a quality that he focused on so much that is also a focus of 1 John and our sermon today. And I want to read it to you so you can see what he said. Here's what Tertullian wrote. It is mainly the deeds of a love so noble that led many to put a brand upon us. See how they love one another, they say, for they themselves are animated by mutual hatred. How they are ready even to die for one another, they say, for they themselves will sooner be put to death. Words from the second century. There's so much food for thought in this quote that we could talk about for hours. What if people in our culture today, outside of the church, took a careful look at us and their impression became, man, those people sure love each other a lot. And they accuse us of that as if it's a bad thing. And if people bash the Christian faith, what if we in the internal part of the church could say, you know, they may just be a little bit jealous of us because we love each other so much. We have that type of relationship within the Christian life. Now, on a side note, Tertullian is one of the people who described Christian love feasts in the early days of Christianity that people in the church would share in the ancient world, very beautifully. And these were very different than the pomp and circumstance of the toga parties that were full of all kinds of, of excess and exclusive, exclusivity in the early days. And they were only invitation only, kind of like the Met Gala that just happened in New York City recently, which... My life would have been more enriched if I'd never heard about it or saw what someone wore to it, honestly. But I happened to be on social media a little bit, and if you were on it at all, it was just inundated with that. But a Christian love feast was very different. 
In fact, there were modest and beautiful banquets, even by Roman standards. And, and they became full of amazing food, amazing wine, and celebration. And even the poorest of attendees were invited to attend and to enjoy and to eat and be satisfied. The church did this as a way of showing themselves and the world what the kingdom of God was like and will be like in the future as well. This, of course, is something that Paul would have us continue to push for in the church. If you've ever read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where he describes the Lord's Supper, that's the background of it. Not necessarily an hour in church on a Sunday morning where we eat a dry wafer and drink a little bit of grape juice, although we celebrate that and commemorate that during that celebration. But the next time you read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I want you to reflect upon the Met Gala and how you were not invited to the Met Gala and probably won't be invited to the Met Gala in the future. But you are always invited into the Lord's Supper to share in that beautiful feast of what the Christian faith is about, celebrating the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus that all people are invited to and to celebrate together. And that is a beautiful picture of what the kingdom is. Now, one more piece of history this morning before I jump into the text here that's important for us, although from a source much more recent. In 2019, there was a really fascinating book that was published by a historian named Tom Holland. Now, don't mix him up with Spider-Man Tom Holland, okay? It's a different guy, although they're both Englishmen, and sometimes they get confused on Twitter. If you follow them, it's pretty funny to see that happen. But Tom Holland wrote a book called Dominion, which was really, really good. Now, I've not read the whole thing. It's very intense. It's very thick, and so it was too much for me in the time that I was reading it. But the point of it is what he says this. It explains what, Christ, what made Christianity so subversive and disruptive in the ancient world. For it completely saturated the mindset of a culture and continues to do so. And he explores then how it goes into our modern Western society and how so many of our instincts today, especially in the, in the West, remain what he would say, for good or ill, is what he says, thoroughly Christian. This is a fascinating thesis, and he traces this throughout history. By, but this is a nice way of saying the whole thing, because Holland, as far as I know, was not a Christian when he wrote this book, and I'm not sure he's a Christian to this day, although he was raised in the church. But he talks about, in his own words, check this quote out, this is what he says. He says, this book is about, how was it that a cult inspired by the execution of an obscure criminal in a long-vanished empire came to exercise such a transformative and enduring influence upon the world? This is a hilarious quote. This is what he says his book is about. And if you put the pieces together, he's talking about Jesus here, of course. And he's talking about the church and how it made such an impact upon society. He says that Christianity, and in particular the story of Jesus, function as an origin story and a cornerstone for the belief that seeking the good of others above your own personal interest is the highest calling of humanity. And he says that originated with Christianity. He's not the only historian to do this. He's just one of the most recent and most popular historians to do it. In Christianity, from its earliest days, the idea of loving someone so much that you want them exalted above your own status, let me just put it this way, was not an early Roman ideal. It was not an ancient world ideal. Heck, friends, it's not a modern world idea. And this is what made Christianity so different. As Dominion points out, the chief end of our lives and our compass point for ethics is that the strongest roots of loving one another come from the teachings of Jesus. From Paul, he would also say, and he would even link it to Augustine, or Augustine, if you're not as formal, if you will. It's crazy. Holland is not the only one to notice these things, but we see it. I tell you these things to contrast with you the idea of what we saw in 1 John chapter 2 today, in particular in verses 7 and 8. As Terry mentioned a minute ago, it's a little bit confusing if you don't catch it. Let's see it one more time, where John writes this. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard, but at the same time it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you. So make up your mind, John, which is it? Is it old? Is it new? Or how can it be old and new at the same time? Well, we have the benefit of hindsight in the church today. If dominion points out that the ethic of love of Jesus, Paul, and Augustine have shaped the ancient world, and this picture of loving one another shaped the ancient world so much that it influences us even today, John here calls it something to draw our attention to what is the ethic of the Christian life. Where it's no new commandment, where it's also an old commandment, 
And it's also a new commandment, as he says it here. And we get to say, okay, I think what's, I see kind of what's going on here. This commandment of John, in other words, was not formed in a vacuum. It has some history to it. And although it took root and spread with Jesus, with Paul's words, in the scriptures that we have, and with the church fathers, such as Augustine, we can also say that the Lord wanted this to be a core value for his people, since they were a people. The people of God were supposed to be a blessing to one another and to the nations in the way that they showed love to one another. And this was supposed to be different. And so it was old. It was as old as the people of God itself. But there's also a paradigm shift for when Jesus came that was highlighted in the time that John wrote his epistle here. And this is what we need to see here, I think, in this first couple verses of 1 John. That part of the story and history of Christianity and what makes it unique and compelling is that starting with Jesus, he proposed a totally new way of seeing people around you. A totally new way of doing society and looking at the world. And even though it's old in the sense that God had this in mind from the beginning, Jesus gives an incredible new paradigm for the people of God and the way they treat one another. And that becomes really the first point of our sermon today, which is the command to love. In 1 John 2, 7 and 8, we see the command to love. So friends, no matter if you're a Christian in here or not today, I want to say that you, if you believe that love is the highest virtue, you got that from something or someone. You have something in mind behind that. You didn't come up with that on your own. You weren't born and coming out of the womb saying, I love everyone completely and unselfishly. No, no. As the children were just dedicated, we can bring the parents up and say, are your kids selfish or are they just loving all the time? They'll all answer the very same thing, right? You didn't come up with this idea that love is the highest of virtue. It came from somewhere. And I would say this, it flows downstream from the creator of the universe. That the God of the Bible created a way of loving that is unique to Christianity, that gives the highest possible virtue in this world to be love. And unless we have that mindset that it came from Christianity, we don't understand what John is actually saying here. John's saying it's not only old, but it's new. It's a way of looking at life that, I have, that God has given to people from the earliest days. And it is a new way of looking at life because your life changes if you really believe it. Live the way that God has designed. This is why it's both old and new. It's even tested in Scripture as old and new, is it not? Excuse me. First, it's old because it's commanded all the way back in the Pentateuch, in Leviticus 19, verse 18. Where in the law, it says this, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, for I am the Lord. See, God has always been love and has always wanted His people to show love. And Jesus even identified this as the second greatest commandment in his time on earth, after his commandment to love God with all, the heart, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, in Matthew chapter 22. In other words, this command has been with God's people for centuries, and so it's old. Moreover, this was an old commandment in the way that these new believers had heard it from its earliest days of Christianity. Whereas I mentioned to you, people looked in with jealousy about their Christian community. It's because they could all say, well, we have this way of living that's old. We have this this way that we think of one another, that we love one another so much. And this is the way we were trained from our earliest days in Christianity. And so every single person who saw the community of Christ and the way they treated one another were living on an old system. And that system is one of love. And so John actually points this out as being something as old as well. As John points out in 1 John 2, 7, he even says it this way. It's from the beginning. And John emphasizes this again in the next chapter we'll look at soon, where he says this is the message that you've heard from when? From the beginning, that we should love one another. The Christians have heard this since the earliest days. This is the way we do it if we are Christians. This is what it looks like to be God's people. But as John says in verse 2-8 here, it's also some way new. Most likely, I think, in the way that Jesus had issued it as a new commandment in John chapter 13. In fact, I think everything in 1 John 2 verses 7-11 through 11, is actually inspired by John 13 verses 34 and 35. Jesus' words, which John surely heard him say himself, all influence what John wrote in 1 John chapter 2. For Jesus in John 13 says this, A new command I give to you, excuse me, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. 
And by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If you notice, John's writings are completely centered on the words of Jesus that issued this, let's call it the old new commandment right here. And I adapted a little bit of John Stott's assessment of this when he talks about the old commandment and how it became new in Jesus. When he wrote in his commentary about four cool ways this became new. And I want to present these to you today to think about how Jesus renewed this idea of the old commandment that we ought to live. And so John writes these four ways. First, it was new in its emphasis, is what John Stott wrote. He says that Jesus brought it together with the command to love God as the summation of the entire law in the Bible. That following all the rules is no longer the point of being God's people anymore, but focusing our heart toward the Lord and toward fellow humanity will in some way fulfill the law in the way that we live. If we love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength, and we love our neighbor as ourself, we've done pretty much that. We've done as much as we can to prove to ourselves that we are Christians. So it's new in its emphasis. Instead of trying to follow all the Mosaic laws, the law is summed up for us in what Jesus says. Second, it's new in its quality, as John Stott says. He says Jesus' own self-sacrifice on the cross became the pattern or became the standard of how Christians ought to love now. Truly loving one another was finally perfected and illustrated in the person and work of Christ. And this is the only time in history where in one person we were able to glimpse what it looked like to truly love one another unselfishly. It's the only time in history it's ever been seen and the only time in history until we are redeemed by God or until Jesus comes again to bring us home that we'll ever see love perfected again until we actually see it worked out in us through the redemption of God through Jesus. And that is a beautiful thing. So in the quality of it, we would never have seen what type of love this really was unless we saw it in Jesus Christ. Third, John says, it is the extent of love that we see as well. For in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus extended the definition of neighbor to go beyond people you just like, to people who are different than you, different religiously than you, different racially than you, different ethnicity than you. That's the story of the Good Samaritan right there itself. Anyone who crosses our path, we've learned, is our neighbor. And Jesus tells us that we should even love our enemies. And this is the extent of love that we ought to see in the world of Christ followers. And finally, the fourth one is, it's new in the disciples' continuing comprehension of it. That the love of Jesus Christ upon the cross is inexhaustible that we could talk about it forever and ever. We could start today and carry on until the end of time and we would never plumb its depths. We'd never get there and talk about how beautiful the love of Christ is for humanity. And so as we grow in the understanding of God's great love to us through Jesus Christ, we will also grow in our comprehension of how we ought to love one another as well. This is four ways Jesus' command to love one another became new. Even though it has that history to it, as we saw at the very beginning that Tertullian and even Dominion's author Tom Holland wrote about, Jesus somehow refreshed it for the people of God and reminded them how they ought to live. So Jesus' command to love is the indeed the old new command. Now, every still illustration breaks down at some point, I know. But a few weeks ago, my family was down in Portland for a family vacation. And my daughter, um, who's almost 18, uh, she wanted to go thrift shopping. And if you don't know, Thrift shopping in Portland is both an education and an experience, I would say. Now, when you go thrift shopping in Portland, um, catching COVID is the least concerned you are about catching anything in, in what possibly might be in those said thrift shops. But the recommendation of Tom McGregor, who's on our staff here, we went into a shop called Hollywood Vintage in Northeast Portland. And I learned a couple things, and I'm going to tell you what I learned today. Number one, if you thought my daughter wanted to go thrifting to save money on clothing, you'd be wrong, Okay. When I learned that she wanted to go thrift store shopping for school clothing, I was stoked. I'm like, yeah, Goodwill, this is awesome, this is going to be a good thing. But I learned something at Portland, that anyone who looks homeless in Portland is actually carefully curating and wearing clothing that they have chosen to wear and have spent lots of money on it, even though it's four generations old. This is what I learned about thrifting in Portland, all right? Also, another thing I learned is that something can be both old and new. At one point, that t-shirt that has a kitten on it that says, hang in there, 
it was cool for someone to wear it originally. Two generations later, it's old and faded, but it's new for a new person as well. And this is interesting. Just like loving one another. It's an old command. Something that looks good in the past and something that I would say looks good on you too. Looks good on me. It looks good in the Christian community to love one another in that way. Do you get it? The old new commandment? Now maybe this gives you an idea of what John means here. But to me, the real surprise comes in the three words of verse 8. When he says it like this, It is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him. And I just explained that to you the four ways. But then he says these three words. And in you. And in you. I'm like, really, John, have you seen the church? Really, have you seen my life? Is it really true in me? This is a staggering statement. I mean, we may get that the command of of love was perfectly seen and fulfilled in Christ, but also in us. But this is what John is telling us that genuine Christianity is all about. For with the coming of Christ, this new age is dawned. And with the new covenant in which God puts our It puts in our hearts his law, writes them in there. He gives us a spirit of God to empower us to love one another and shows us who Christ is, who perfectly fulfilled the law and made available to us his divine resources to do it together within the context of the church and world as well. And this is an amazing gift for us that we can actually love one another in that same way. Now, Christ's love displayed for us is meant to be actually lived out among us. This display in us where the darkness of the old age, where men and women did not love properly, is passing away. And the light of the new age is coming, where love is perfected, as the title of our sermon series is called, and it is shining in the context of a loving Christian community. This is why I think this entire passage we heard today is trying to help us understand one key idea, and that's this. Friends, if you want to grow in your faith, you must grow in your love for others. This is the key. Some people are like, how do I become a mature Christian? You start loving other people. This is the key. This is the foundation building block of learning how to grow in your faith. It's funny, I think some Christians want to go deeper in their faith by a whole number of things that aren't necessarily wrong and are good things, but aren't the litmus test for how we grow in Christianity. We think how much theology we know or how much Bible we can quote are the most important things about us. And these things are important and super important for us as Christians to hide God's word in our heart, to study theology well, and to know those things. But friends, hear me. The pathway to deeper faith in Christianity, according to John, is laid out here in verses 1 through 14 in 1 John 2. As Pastor Tom talked about last week, the first pathway is what we can call the pathway of obedience, where it says, by this we have come to know him if we keep his commandments, that our calling is to live as Jesus did. And the answer to how did Jesus live, what was the way he lived his life, is I've explained today, he lived a life of love. And so the second pathway John lays out super clearly here is that whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. In 1 John 2 verse 10, that our calling then becomes to love as Jesus loved as well. This is the pathway to maturity in the life of a Christian. Friends, the truth is that our understanding and reception of God's love is actually provable to the outside world that people could look in and see something different about the way we treated each other and treated even those outside the church. It's demonstrated both our obedience, the things that, that we do, that Pastor Tom again talked about last week, and our genuine love towards one another. Just like Tertullian noted, see how they love each other. See how that community is different. Once again, we go back to that paradigm of John's gospel we've told you about. The gospel doctrine should flow downstream into gospel culture. That knowing the truth, that knowing what the Bible tells us about who Jesus is, what he's done for us, how he substituted his life, died on a cross for our sins to give us both a justification for sins and an example of how we ought to live our lives. And out of that comes a belief in that, that we believe by grace through faith that we are saved. When we are saved, we move into this realm of living out gospel culture in community. And when we do that, it shows in our love for one another. And I would love the world to look at us and say, man, those people really love each other in an odd way. And I would love even the world to look at us with jealousy and say, I want that. I want to experience that type of community. For friends, it should be odd. It should look different compared to the rest of the world and the way that we see things in the world today. John brings up the alternative in the second part of this passage that we looked at today. 
which is a little more frightening. I'm going to call it here, the second part of our sermon, the problem of hate. And that's in 1 John 2, 9-11, through where he writes the words I just read a second ago, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. Now, when I read this passage, I think that hate is a word that lets me off easy. Because I think to myself, well, I really don't hate people, but I don't think it's supposed to mean hate in the same way that we typically think about it. As if it's a big emotional or visceral response to someone that we think of in our culture as hate. So I'm going to explore for just a moment what John means here. Interestingly enough, the Greek word miseo, which is translated to hate, occurs 39 times in the New Testament. Check this out. 20 of them are used by John. It's an important concept to him. More than half of these times that it's used, it's used by John. And as you explore this a little bit, you find out that the, the verb hate has some important nuance to John and to us. And depending on context, the verb actually ranges from a meaning of simply disfavor someone to actually detest someone. Now, our English translation in thinking of the word hate usually suggests some sort of deep emotional connotation that doesn't always do justice to what John might be doing here, especially in a shame-honor culture where John uses the word hate in a way that doesn't translate super well into English. Even the Jewish background would play into this where the Hebrew word sane has a definition of holding in disfavor, be disinclined towards, or have relatively little regard for. That's the illustration and the imagery of the word hate in John. To me, this gets way more personal. Why? Because I can think of relatively few people in my life that I've had intense, effective emotion about, where I can say I've actually hated that person. But I can think of several people in my life where I've disfavored them, or I've not regarded someone else above myself. So what is hate to John? I think I can say it this way. Hate is just the absence of love. Think about that. It's ignoring someone. It's disfavoring someone. It's indifference towards someone. In other words, I don't think in John's mind that love can be ambivalent as much as we want it to be. As much as we think that love can just be an idea out there. And hate is not just being emotionally furious at someone. See, I I think the problem of hate is this. We think that the word hate does not apply to us. That's the problem of hate. But I think John would argue with you and say it does. For if you have absence of love towards anyone else, that is actually hate of someone else. And that's when it gets super personal. Many times I think that... uh, Oh, I think that John, excuse me, wants us to get to understand the presence of Christian Christian love in our lives is either all or nothing. I think that's what he's aiming at here. That you either actively show love towards someone or you don't. And John defines that as that hate idea. I I like to think of neutral categories sometimes between love and hate. I like to think that there might be some uh, instance in there, some continuum, if you will, that I can live according to that both those words kind of Get me off the hook, if you will. But many times as we try to categorize our relationships, we think that there are people that it's easy to love and the people that we do our best to love. And then there are people out there that we just kind of ignore because they're hard on us. They're difficult for us. They're difficult people. Uh, Grace required is the word that we use for some people in our lives. You know, I've heard that said before. And I wonder how often that is a picture of us trying our best to hide our feelings towards that person. Now, I'm not saying we have to be BFFs with everyone. Don't hear me saying that. That's not how life works. But when you look at another human being, your calling, friends, is not to be indifferent towards that person. This goes for the person in our church. This goes for the person in our work, our school, our social media feed. You fill in the blank. To not be indifferent to those those that God has put in your path. And to keep walking through this passage, what's crazy here is if you learn not to hate someone in the way that John is talking about here, as he says, you love and abide in the light, is what John says in verse 10, and that there is no cause for stumbling, which is why I link maturity a minute ago, growing in our Christian faith, to loving one another. Because all of a sudden you no longer stumble, is what John says. Stumble in the context of the New Testament, of course, means to fall into sin or apostasy which is exactly what's going on here in these churches in John's day. And so the point becomes that Christian love for all people is the outworking of our faith that will help you to be guarded against falling, that will keep you from being a person who walks in any kind of darkness, 
Friends, again, if you want to grow in your Christian faith, don't walk in hate. Walk in love. Don't walk in indifference. Walk in love. That's more important than your study of the Word at times. You know, as long as if you're applying God's study of Word to your life to love one another, it's not more important. But it's more important than memorizing things or knowing theology or allowing yourself to be puffed up with all of those things. Actively working out your salvation in love is so important. I think this is justified by Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 and 2, where he says, For if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, seems pretty mature, doesn't it? But have not love. What am I? Nothing. So if the presence of Christian love will keep you grounded, it can be easily assumed that the absence of Christian love, what we define as hate, will make you easy prey for the devil here. And this is what happened. In 1 John 2, 9-11, through we see the word whoever. But it can be seen as the one who says. It reminds us that, that, that anyone could be in trouble with this happening to them. That they can claim to be spiritual, and yet apparently they can be lost. And the conclusion of the matter in 1 John 2.11 is frightening. Because when we see what this actually plays out to be, John says there are four things that are true of a person that lives in this indifference towards another person in verse 11. Look at it again in verse 11. It says, first you're in darkness, spiritual death. Second, you walk in darkness or live in darkness, as Tom mentioned last week, that illustration there is about living out the Christian life. Third, you don't know where you're going. And fourth, you're blind. That's the picture you get of someone who does not walk in the light and love their brother. And this is a bleak picture. How many of us have seen this phrase, whoever hates his brother, the darkness has blinded his eyes, become a reality for those around us and even in our own life? Have you ever seen people that are blind to someone else's pain? Have you ever seen people that you know that, that feel like they're right about whatever issue it is that they feel passionate about, but they are completely tone deaf towards those around them and blind towards any other points of view out there? Again, if the definition of hate is not passion and anger, but indifference, I think then we've seen this work out in our culture and sometimes in the context of the church in so many ways. There are some low-hanging fruit examples, and let me give them to you for you to think about and ponder this morning. Number one is our political system. It's built on the foundation that a person is, if they're not on your side about all things, then they must be treated with at best suspicion or at worst as an enemy, right? doesn't matter what side you believe, doesn't matter what side you're on, but if you look at the other side in that way, that's either indifference or something else is going on there. That's low-hanging fruit, of course. There's the constant vitriol that spews back and forth about everything related to COVID or public policy right now. We've seen that as well. Whether it's vaccines, masks, economics, it's all in there. It's all mixed up in this vitriol of society. We have to be careful with that as Christians. We see darkness blinding the eyes of us when we won't listen to another person's story. Whichever side they're on again, and we just assume something about another person based on what we see about them on a regular basis. And we haven't even completely tried to understand a person or have a conversation with them about how we can truly engage with them about who, what, what's going on and why do you hold to that view and what can I learn from you. This is an act of love to do that, to not treat someone with suspicion or indifference, but to listen as much as we can. And as alarmingly for me as a pastor in these past couple years, since we've been conditioned, I think, to hold others in suspicion as a culture, we won't engage in things that are important to God. Things like biblical justice conversations which we say biblical because we believe it's biblical. And there's certainly blindness going on. We won't listen to or at least hear the struggles of people who are maybe oppressed that we don't understand completely. The most low-hanging fruit one is those who are oppressed because of racial relations. And that's a tough thing for us to gather, especially if we have a mindset and a, and a, and a way of thinking. And our heart as Christians is to say, no, I don't want to be blinded. I don't want to have blind spots. I want to listen and I want to do the best I can. And I'm not saying you just jettison what you believe I'm not saying that. I'm saying you engage and you don't throw stones. You don't walk away from the conversation and you allow love to lead that conversation as much as you can. Sometimes loving even means disagreeing with someone or sometimes being real clear about what you believe to someone and saying what is right and wrong. And that's okay as well. But you can do that lovingly. You don't have to be a jerk when you do that. And this is so important for our culture to hold firm conviction of truth, grace and truth, but to be as loving as possible to those that might differ than us. Man, if we can do this in the church, don't, don't you think, guys, that the world's going to go in and say, I want that? The world's a mess, is it not? 
I mean, we live in this world where we just have so many people just throwing stuff at each other on a regular basis. And if the church could do it differently, if we can live out this old new commandment, how beautiful would that be? How compelling could that be to the watching world where they could look in and see, see, see how they love one another? Or maybe like Tertullian, he can say, man, those, we can just sit in here and say, the world's just jealous the way we treat one another. It's amazing that we can do this. We can have conversations about things that are awkward that the world can't because all they know how to do is to throw stones at each other where we have learned to engage in the conversation and to walk forward together and to believe the best about another person as much as possible within the context of the church. This is hard. I admit to you, friends, I don't do this perfectly. I have my preconceived ideas. I have the things and the emotion that comes up when I read social media. I feel all these feelings. I have views about these things. And I know I wrestle with them on a regular basis. But if I allow the Spirit of God through the work of Jesus in my life to transform me from the inside out, I believe it can change the way we view church and the way that we do church on a regular basis. And that's my hope, that people would look in and say, see how they love one another. And I think that's why John, at the very end of this passage, which is how I'm going to close today, gives us a portrait of gospel culture. At the very end of this, which I feel like is a little bit parenthetical, if you will, there's this poem at the very end. And if you notice this, he does this thing where he talks of three groups of people. Children, fathers, and young men. And each group is addressed twice right here. Now we could argue long periods of time on this is specific people in the church or whatever it is, and those conversations are fun. But just for the lack of time today, I just want to tell you, I think these are representing people within the context of the church. I think these are people that are the different types of people. Those who are new Christians, those who are young in the faith, and those who are growing Christians or mature Christians that are understanding gospel doctrine, and that's leading them to apply gospel culture. For he says to the new Christians, he says, man, you guys finally understand that your sins are forgiven, and now you know the Father. And they're learning how to apply that in their lives. And when they understand that they're forgiven, they turn around and they forgive others. Because Ephesians 4.32 tells us to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as Christ forgave you. That's the picture of what it means to be a new Christian. Understanding you're forgiven, so you forgive. To those of you who are young in faith, John says you're winning the battle against the evil one, twice there, and the word of God abides in you and you are strong. You're growing right now. You're learning how to apply that. But here's the cool thing. Do you remember how to overcome evil? We just got out of Romans chapter 12. This was so cool. Paul tells us to let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. In doing so, you love one another with brotherly affection and you outdo one another in showing honor. <laughs> the work of God and the work of allowing the Word of God to live in you and overcoming the evil one is actually learning to outdo one another in showing honor. And then finally, to those who are mature, John says, you know Him who is from the beginning. Well, what does it mean to know God? First John 4, eight says this, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Did you catch this? At every phase of the Christian life, there is, a con- there is a connection where gospel doctrine leads into gospel culture. This is the pathway to maturity. If you want to grow, no matter what phase of life that you are at, you will learn how to apply this truth of your forgiveness, you're hiding God's word in your heart, you're overcoming the evil one, you're overcoming temptation with this sense of applying it not only to yourself personally, but here's the part that's important, applying it within the community of Christ. This is important. I would pray, my prayer for us, my prayer for me, friends, is that we are a church that John describes in these verses and that the world looks so fondly upon that finally says, see how they love one another. May the Lord help us with that. Will you pray with me about these things? God, love perfected is an intense title because I think we get caught up in this idea of how can that be possible? And I think we got an illustration of it today, Lord, because this is what you're working out in us. And Lord, I would pray that you would give us the ability now to apply your word to our lives and our lives in community. This message of loving one another, just it's littered throughout John. It seems like it comes up over and over again. And I think there's a reason for that, because we need the reminders, Lord. I pray that you would give us the ability to do it through the Spirit of God, that you would help us to grow in our faith, to maturity, Lord, And in that maturity, you would help us learn to love one another well. So Lord, as we respond to you now and take a few minutes to process these words and the things that you're saying through your word, God, would you give us conviction of sin where we need it? 
encouragement where we need it. Some of us may in here feel beat down from trying to love one another well. And Lord, I pray if that's people in here that you would encourage them in their continued love for one another. I pray for the conviction of sin for those who have treated others with suspicion or fear or anger. Lord, may you help them to not walk in darkness and not be blinded by their own preconceived ideas. With all of us, Lord, I pray. Give us the ability to do that. Help us to live out that vision you have for the church to allow gospel doctrine to transform us into gospel culture. Thank you, Lord, for this. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.